In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, and fill your faithful with holy joy. For on those you have rescued from slavery to sin, you have bestowed eternal gladness. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, gang. We are moving along. Uh, so we are already in our third section here, uh, titled uh, Egypt and Exodus. Uh, this is where we start getting um, archaeological evidence. Um, trying to think if there's any... Well, yeah, Turkey claims to have the uh, Noah's Ark, and there's some interesting evidence to that, but um, it, you start getting more evidence, because this is starting to enter into, you know, just, just history uh, uh, as we know it, not ancient, ancient history, but we're getting closer. And so you can start looking at, uh, start comparing what we're reading in the, in the Bible with what uh, historians and um, archaeologists are saying, etc. Uh, in fact, I'm going to recommend to you right off the bat uh, that uh, you watch a documentary that came out in 2014 that was very impressive which I think is the reason why uh, this timeline used to say something like 1246 B.C. as being the time of the Exodus, but you'll notice here it's 1446. I think this documentary really helped ch uh, change the narrative, not that I'm a scripture scholar and know how the narrative's always going on, but traditionally you would hear about the Exodus taking place around 1200 whatever B.C., but it's based on an assumption that um, the pharaoh and the towns being built. Um, so, for instance, it, it, we'll start diving in here in a second, but uh, in, uh, Exodus 1, uh, verse 11, talks about the Jews are having to build, uh, for pharaoh, store cities, uh, Pithon and Ramesses. And so the issue is that, all right, Ramesses wasn't around in the 1400s. But yet, in the Bible, it says um, Ramesses. And so, uh, back in the 50s, a uh, woman, I forget her name, uh, was an archaeologist and excavated um, um, Jericho, which we'll be going into after Exodus, of course, and going conquering the Holy Land. And she made a very good argument that in the 1200s, there was no evidence that this city was destroyed. And she's right, because they were looking in the wrong century. Because it's all based on what name was given here at the beginning of Exodus. And so the best analogy I can hear uh, that I've heard of that seems to apply to this um, is uh, who founded New York? I'm asking you, who founded New York? The Dutch? Did the Dutch found New York? Well, all right, no, no, we're, we're, we're sticking with the Dutch, I get it. Uh, but did the Dutch found New York? They, found, they founded what? Founded. New Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. But for us to say the Dutch founded New York, you know, that applies. And so it would seem that whether it was Moses or a later edition or something, I don't know, uh, they give the name Ramesses, but that'd be like saying... Uh, New York, when really you're looking for New Amsterdam. And so uh, this documentary goes through a hypothesis that actually it's the city of Averis, which did exist in the 1400s. And if you, see, it's all based on one assumption, one name in one book. And, but if you apply this theory to the case that really we're talking about New Amsterdam, not New York then everything starts uh, clicking into place. And then you go to the 1400s BC in Jericho, and you do see a destruction of the city. In fact, uh, jars half filled with grain, meaning that wasn't, you know, it wasn't at the end. It was a sudden thing. There was still food, etc. And so everything begins to click into place, including in Egyptian history. So at any rate, we're getting into really cool uh, historical and archaeological stuff right now. And so the, the um, documentary that I'm referencing is called Patterns of Evidence. Patterns of Evidence. And I'll have this sticky up here. Um, 
that's really the only thing I would write on the board, but I'm not going to go through the rigmarole of <laughs> opening that. So Patterns of Evidence, a really uh, interesting um, documentary that I think even impacted uh, Jeff Cavins in this. So, all right. We need to get through a good chunk uh, of Exodus. So let's, um, let's dive right in, shall we? All right, so Exodus chapter 1. We begin uh, talking about who went down to Egypt, okay? And uh, so it's, um, uh, Jacob or, or Israel, his, his sons, verse 5, all of the offspring of Jacob were 70 persons, and Joseph was already there in Egypt. Now there's a discrepancy because the Greek version has 75 as opposed to 70, but we're not going to go too far into that. And then verse 8, um, now there arose a new king, a new pharaoh in Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the sons of Israel are too many and are too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war befall us, they join our enemies. And so they're going to be enslaved. Therefore, they set, uh, verse 11, taskmasters uh, over them to afflict them with heavy burdens they built these two uh, store cities that we talked about. Uh, Twelve, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and they spread abroad. Sort of like the church. When the church begins being um, persecuted in Acts of the Apostles, it, begins, it grows. And when the Latin Mass is persecuted, it quadruples in size. Um, it just happens again and again. Um, so, uh, and the Egyptians were in dread of the sons of Israel, and so they made the life bitter for them um, the, in hard service and mortar and brick, and so they're building a bunch of buildings. Okay. And then uh, verse 15, uh, Pharaoh gives the instruction to the Hebrew midwives, all right, any future boy that is born, you're to kill him immediately. Girls can live. Um, and... I have an interesting note that around this time in the 1400s BC of the graves, about 50% of them were infants. That's pretty cool. So at any rate, um, but these midwives aren't going to heed that. I mean, that is just cruel, right? And so they, um, so the Hebrew women have their babies without the midwives and even the midwives are involved. They're, they're not going to be killing these boys. And so, um, verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born of the Hebrews, you shall cast into, into the Nile, but let every daughter live. So, uh, sort of like Pharaoh and his army is going to be, um, you know, plunged into the Red Sea and killed. All right, chapter two, uh, we hear about the uh, Moses' origin story. The name Moses literally means to draw out because he's going to be drawn out of the, the Nile River and also he's going to draw the Jewish people out of um, Egypt, so it's, his name is also a vocation. All right, so uh, now a man from the house of Levi, okay, remember, Levi, 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 that is number three, but remember, he was passed over because of his violence. Uh, so um, Moses and Aaron, for as important as they are, they're not part of this lineage, but they are still important nonetheless. Okay, um, uh, okay, so this woman conceived, and at the third month, uh, she was clearly, uh, wait, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months, then she knew she couldn't hide him any longer, so she uh, uh, put him in a basket, and um, put him into the Nile River, uh, floated him down the river, and guess who's downstream but the daughter of Pharaoh, who's going down to the river to bathe. And she says, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And then she wants the child for her own. And then she's like, well, we need a woman to nurse him. So she calls for a Hebrew woman to nurse. And um, it's Moses' mom. So Moses' mom not only gets to nurse her own son and not watch him die, but also she gets paid for being um, a wet nurse there. And so, um, so that's nice. But then, But Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh. So he's thoroughly sort of Egyptianized, as, as it were. 
Uh, skip down to verse 11. One day when Moses had grown up, uh, he went, so he's, he's 40 years old. He went out, uh, he went out to his people and looked at their, on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian, hit him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man um, that did the wrong, why do you strike your fellow? He said, who, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. And then when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. So this sort of looks like a precursor to the book of Exodus, doesn't it? An Egyptian beating a Hebrew, uh, Moses being instrumental in the death of the Egyptian, but then the Hebrews thereafter uh, quarreling and, and, and fighting. And then them asking, who made you a judge over us? which is a question they're going to be asking a lot uh, once they escape Egypt, etc. Um, so, Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he stayed in the land of Midian. So, where is Midian? Midian is, if this is um, Egypt, where my pinky is, and um, it's in Arabia, so... Uh, so Israel goes all the way down to this gulf, and so Midian is just on the other side. Uh, so at any rate, so that's, that's where you are geographically. So he goes over there, and he sits by a well. What generally happens by a well? Marriage. Marriage. And this is no exception. So uh, he, um, now the priest of, uh, of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and Moses helps them out, and then they get done with their job early, so they go to their father, um, and he's like, how did you get done so quickly? Well, an Egyptian uh, helped us, and so he wants to meet the Egyptian, so um, call him that we may eat bread. Verse 21, Moses was content to dwell with the man, uh, and uh, he gave Moses uh, his daughter, Zipporah, and she bore a son and called him Gershom. But we're not really going to hear much about his son. You know, Aaron's son we hear about, but not really Moses' son. So I guess his lineage, again, is not too, too important. Um, so uh, we just get some B-roll. The course of many days, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, dies. Sons of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried for help. Um, and their cry under bondage came up to God. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. This is interesting. What priesthood is this? Your priesthood gets very, very limited in through the course of going through the desert, you, where the Levitical priesthood will be established. Uh, we will notice that there were two priesthoods before and after the golden calf. Before the golden calf, it was much broader. It was like the firstborn sons would be the priests of each family. But then after the golden calf incident, we'll get there, uh, it's like, all right, new rules. It, things are going to be much more strict and um, difficult, and only the tribe of Levi will be the priestly tribe. So, but before the whole golden calf thing, before God is revealing how he wants to be worshipped, we saw what? Melchizedek as a priest offering things. Cain and Abel were offering things. Uh, and now this Midian, who is this? Um, he's, he's a priest. And in no way is he portrayed in a bad light. So it's almost as if uh, the priesthood was like primordial to the human race and and any like firstborn son, for instance, could, could operate as a priest and offer sacrifice, and it wasn't an offense. Whereas after the revelation, I guess that, that changes a bit, but one step at a time. So uh, Moses is, uh, he's going to be living here for 40 years. And uh, so he's gonna be, he'll be 80 when he gets his start <laughs> vocationally. <laughs> And so he's working for his father-in-law, who's a priest, um, and he leads his flock on the west side, blah, 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 to came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So this whole burning bush story. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush ain't burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. So the first time in hundreds of years, God is speaking yet again. And this is what he says, Moses, Moses, here I am. Don't come near, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. I am the God of your father, um, the God of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face. Uh, for he was afraid to look at God. So a sense of awe, a sense of reverence, reverential fear, um, as opposed to us 21st century people just kind of walking into the house of God and wanting to be served, you know, type of deal. Were there other gods? No. Well, why do you have to say Abraham? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the same God who made covenants with um, these three right. different men. But there weren't other gods in reality, no. They are demons, or nothing at all. Uh, but people thought they were other gods. And they ascribed divinity to them, but at the end of the day, these are, these are demons, if, if anything. There's only one God. There can only be one God, um, by definition. Um, but that gets really philosophical really quick. I think, uh, God said, um, this is verse 7, I have seen the affliction of my people, I've heard their cry, um, because of their taskmasters and sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a good and broad land flowing with milk and honey, uh, where all these other people are currently inhabiting. Verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses says, Who am I, I that I should go forth to Pharaoh and bring, uh, bring the Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this will be a, the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. So the sign is really going to be the whole dang thing. And when all this is done, um, it will be made clear that I, God, have sent you, Moses. And then God reveals his name. This is a very important time in salvation history. Moses said to God, If I come to the sons of Israel and they ask who sent you, verse four, uh, he asks, what is your name? Verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Um, that's how God reveals his name. And you can go very philosophical, very deep on this one. God is existence. God is reality itself. You see, you and I just participate in reality, but God is uh, reality. Um, so it's a, it's a very meta, metaphysical um, uh, um, understanding uh, here, very almost philosophical. And uh, so God is reality. Um, so before the created world even came to be, God, I am. Like an eternal present. Uh, um, he always is. Okay, and so um, you're to tell them that uh, I am has sent you, that I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, go gather the elders of Israel together um, and you know, tell them. And then we're going to take you out of this land, bring you to modern day, uh, to Canaan, Canaan etc. Um Okay, so let's go down to verse 18, about halfway through, and say to him, that is to Pharaoh, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now we beg you, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. All right, so that is, that's going to be the first demand. But notice, and I mean, maybe I shouldn't get ahead of myself. We'll just, we'll just let it play out. Um, we'll let it play out. But God's saying, all right, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. You're going to say this. And uh, I know that Pharaoh ain't going to listen to you. 
I'll stretch out my hand and strike Egypt, um, and uh, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So basically, when you're going to leave, every woman's going to ask her neighbor for uh, jewelry, silver, gold, clothing, and they will give it to you. They will be so freaked out that they will, they, uh, when you come asking for all this stuff, they will absolutely give it to you, and you will thus despoil the Egyptians. All right, so that's what's going to play out. God's giving Moses a heads up. Now we're going into chapter 4. God gives Moses help for his mission. So he's going to give him three signs. Because you don't just go up to the king and say, by the way, you're going to give me what I want. You better like do something. And so God tells Moses, all right, take the staff in your hand, throw it on the ground. And it turned into a snake. He said, grab it by the tail, turn back into a rod. That would be the first sign. Then he says, put your hand into your, into your, into your clothing, in, in your bosom, and pull it out again. And it's going to be um, white as leprosy, a leprous white. And then you put it back in, pull it out, and it will be fine. And then the third sign is that you'll take some water from the Nile and pour it onto the ground. And the water which you shall take from the Nile will become blood upon the dry ground. So God's going to give him three signs. But Moses, despite having those three signs, Moses is still looking like looking at his own inadequacy, maybe trying to get out of it, I don't know. He says, but I am not eloquent in speech. And then uh, God gets angry with him. Um, where does it say that? Yeah, yeah, 14, there it is. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. So Moses ain't getting very far with God before he's already taken him off. Uh, so he's like, all right, fine, Aaron, your brother, he will speak for you. So you will be like God, Aaron will be like uh, a prophet, and Aaron will speak on your behalf, right? You're out of excuses, Moses, get to work. So this is all still happening in Midian, not in Egypt. God talking to, to Moses um, at and perhaps after the burning bush. And then verse 18, Moses returns to Egypt. So God tells him, the men that were seeking to kill you are dead. Sort of like uh, St. Joseph. Um, all right, and then Moses took with him the rod of God. Interesting that they call it that. Verse 21, Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles which I have put in your power, but I will, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Uh, so, and we'll see this again and again, and why does God harden his heart? Why doesn't God just let him have free choice in the matter? Uh, that's where, like, St. Augustine's going to be talking about um, predestination and, and, and free will and grace and stuff like that. Um, Fess, I'm thinking it was coming from uh, Fulton Sheen, who said that, um, you know, the same sun can uh, soften wax but harden mud. Uh, and as the same sun cuts closer, uh, then whatever's uh, predisposed to harden will harden type of deal. But at any rate, it really just kind of reminds you just how much God's providence is everywhere. Um, so, um, and then verse 22, this is important. And you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my first born son and I say to you let my son go that he may serve me so Israel being God's first born son very important because fast forward to the temptation in the desert uh, the three times the devil says to our Lord uh, if you are the son of God turn this rock into bread or cast yourself down and angels will save you or whatever and so, keep in mind, the people of Israel are like the firstborn son of all the nations. And you also see that in the teachings of our Lord, the prodigal son. You have the older son, representing the Jewish people, who's always with the father, working hard, staying away from the pigs. And then the younger son is there, you know, living a life of dissipation and with the pigs. And so the younger son would be the other nations. But that idea of the people being God's firstborn son, keep in mind. All right, so let my son go that he may serve me. Freedom for worship. 
freedom for divine service, not freedom qua freedom. And then uh, verse 24, there's a strange, on the, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord uh, met him, Moses, and sought to kill Moses. Whoa, why? 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 Because he was uncircumcised. And so his uh, wife took flint. Um, oh, oh, his son was uncircumcised, sorry. Uh, God, Moses, yeah. And so, and cut her son's uh, foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Don't ask me why. Do not ask me why. I don't know. So, um, yeah, so the circumcision is important. Um, all right, so then the Lord said to Aaron, um, all right, go into the wilderness. Your brother's coming. Go meet him. And so Moses tells Aaron, you know, everything's going on. Then Moses and Aaron gather together the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron speaks on behalf of Moses. And they did the three signs in front of them. And the people believed when they heard that the Lord had visited the sons of Israel, etc. And they bowed in worship. Confuse me how these these servants of Pharaoh could do the same thing to work. We're getting there. We're getting there. You're going to get there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and was Aaron up in Egypt? Um, I assume Aaron was still in Egypt. Because Moses was going back to Egypt. And met him. Um, maybe met him outside of Egypt. Said, got to go, to the, go into the wilderness to meet. So... Maybe he kind of meets Moses as he's coming close. I, I don't know. All right. Um, so uh, now the story's going to heat up. Chapter 5. So bricks without straw. So Moses and Aaron are going to go to, Moses, to Pharaoh and say, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Uh, Pharaoh's like, Who's the Lord that I'm going to do this? I don't know him. And he said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go. We beg a three, day, a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and the sword. So the first request is not to leave. Leave, leave. It's just to go three days journey, which is out of sight, and to sacrifice to God. And this is where uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, who later becomes Pope Benedict XVI, begins a very, very important book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, talking about the importance of divine worship. All of redemption is meant towards serving God and worshiping to God. And we'll see this play out. Um, Okay, and Moses is like, yeah, no, get back to your burdens. And then um, Pharaoh, or excuse me, Pharaoh said, "No, get back to your burdens." And by the way, uh, we've been supplying your straw for this brick and mortar operation. You get to go gather the straw yourself now. So he adds to their to their trouble because Moses is heeding God's word, and we're going to see that again and again. Uh, Moses heeding God's word ends up causing more trouble for the people. And how do people respond? Usually they start freaking out and yelling at them. So they are failing the test. All right, but we'll get to that. And so uh, this starts happening. Verse 22, the Moses turned again to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Um, Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Moses uh, to speak in your name, he has done evil uh, to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Moses is getting testy, too. So now we're in chapter 6. The Lord said to Moses, uh, Now you uh, you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Uh, For with a strong hand, um, he will send them out. Yes, the strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. Then um, God promises. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I guess when he says that, it's like, I'm remembering my covenant with them. I'm their God because I made a covenant with them, and therefore I'm going to hold myself to that covenant. So I'm still the God that has made these covenants with your ancestors. Uh, This is, yeah, uh, verse 3 now. I appeared to them, 
uh, as Almighty God, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So, Revelation is uh, unfolding. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't even know God's name. Now, this is a critical point in salvation history, we know God's name. Okay, and when you know a name, you can enter into a relationship with that person. You can call upon that person. Uh, in deliverance ministry, uh, one of the key goals of the exorcist is to ascertain the name of the demon, uh, which he will keep guarded uh, until he just beats it out of him. And then once he has the name of the demon, um, we'll have power over him. Yeah, Bob? Um, why in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it starts out, and uh, God is using the first person, and then later in the same sentence, he switches to the third person. That's getting in the weeds, Bob. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, all right. So, uh, but verse 5, um, look, God says, I've heard the, the groanings of the sons of Israel, and I have remembered my covenant. Um, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I'll deliver you. So this is, uh, again, verse 6, but further along in verse 6. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will redeem. That may be the first time we see the word redeem in, in Scripture. I could be wrong, but I'm not remembering it prior. What does redeem mean? Red emere, to buy back. To buy back. I will buy you back. Uh, but do so um, with great judgment. And I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Then um, Moses uh, relayed this to the uh, sons of Israel, but they did not believe Moses. Verse 9. And uh, because of their broken spirit and their cruel burdens and bondage. But the Lord said to Moses, Go in and tell Pharaoh to let my uh, sons go. Pharaoh said to the Lord, Behold, uh, your, not even your people will listen to me. Uh, how then shall Pharaoh listen to me? Um, but the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, gave them charges uh, to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh the king. So he's like, get on with it anyways. Then this next section, we get uh, the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. And uh, there's nothing really of note uh, here for our, our considerations today, uh, so let's just let's just skip. All right, although there are some pretty cool things in there. Okay, but then towards the end of chapter six, Moses and Aaron obey God's command, and let's go into chapter seven, verse two. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh. Uh, to let Israel go, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And through and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring forth my hosts, etc. All right. Then it says, verse seven: uh, Moses is eighty years old, and Aaron eighty-three. Then verse eight. Now we get uh, the the signs um, to. For, for Pharaoh's consideration. God says to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove uh, by working a miracle, you're to cast down the rod and it will become a serpent, etc. And so they do that. Uh, verse 10, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron cast down his rod, becomes a serpent. Verse 11, then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers. And they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Uh, for every man cast down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Okay, so a couple things here. Um, the, you will see references to this in deliverance ministry as well. Um, these secret arts are around the whole world. Um, people learn to 
get into relationships with uh, spiritual entities that we would identify as demons. And they would create various rituals or whatever. Um, and so this is, all, this is all demonology stuff. And the scary thing about uh, secret arts and you know, quote-unquote wise men and sorcerers is that they do actually work. That's the scary thing. Uh, tarot cards and palm readers and stuff are bad, not because they're silly, but because they actually work. Um, when they are able to obtain um, arcane knowledge or, or secret knowledge of things or of the future or whatever, it's because they, they are coming to knowledge by means of demonic help of angelic, a fallen angel. Um, the same with... Uh, um, it's scary, but um, people do sell their souls to the devil for various things, uh, celebrities included. Uh, it, this was around 2015-ish um, that Lady Gaga had an incredible interview uh, about how she had sold her soul. Uh, she met this mysterious beautiful man in a dark alley. She was like singing these small little uh, places in Manhattan going nowhere. But then this, you know, this dark mysterious figure, this, this man uh, offered to make her famous, something like that. And it was clearly a deal and she accepted it. And immediately she became uber, uber famous. But when the devil comes back for payment, he comes back. And she's been like in agony since uh, with whatever physical ailments uh, she suffers from, uh, et cetera. So that's just one example. Honestly, I don't know the veracity of it, but uh, she sounded like a broken woman when she was relaying the story. We'll put it that way. Um, and there are other stories with other celebrities. And we don't need to go into that because that'll just be a distraction, but some major celebrities. So uh, these things are real. And, um, and in scripture is, is proving that. But what's the important thing? That Aaron's serpent swallows up the others. God is more powerful than this nonsense. He allows it to happen. Now we're going to go into the plagues. Um, and uh, we're not going to go line by line. Uh, but we're going to see kind of Pharaoh's reaction to each of them. And then the request from Moses and Aaron. So the first plague is uh, that the water of the Nile turns to blood. And so um, they go to Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. Uh, as Pharaoh's going out to the, to, the, to the water, and you're to say to him as he's going out towards the river, uh, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, you have not yet obeyed. And was like, or Pharaoh's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then, um, uh, which one is it, Moses or Aaron? This is verse 20. Moses and Aaron in the sight of, as the Lord commanded, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his ser uh, servants, he lifted up the rod. Oh, Aaron did. Okay, so Aaron lifts up the rod and struck the water that was in the Nile. And it all becomes blood. But verse 22 but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. Okay. Um, but Pharaoh uh, turned and went into his house, and, um, and he did not lay even this to heart. So uh, Pharaoh is not yet moved. Second plague be the frogs. So seven days pass, and um, Aaron's to stretch out his hand with the rod over the rivers, and frogs are to infest everything, but the magicians of Egypt, by their secret arts, do the same thing. Uh, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, and so now Pharaoh is going to be a little bit different here. Entreat the Lord to take away the frogs uh, from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, and so Moses cries out to the Lord, and all the frogs died, and they stunk up the land. Um, verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw uh, that there was a respite, he hardened his heart, okay, would not listen to them. Third plague, the, the gnats. 
So same thing happens. Aaron stretches out his hand with the rod. Um, and then all these gnats come. The magicians tried by their secret arts this time. This is verse 18. But they could not. So for whatever reason, um, these demon summer summoners uh, could not um, do the same thing with the gnats. And so they're everywhere. And even these magicians said to Pharaoh, the finger of God. This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Then the fourth plague, the swarm of flies. So a bunch of flies uh, infest the land except for where the Hebrews are living. And then um, Mo, uh, Pharaoh called to Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. So he's, he's changing his willingness. All right, you can sacrifice, but you've got to be in this land. Moses is like, no, um, it would not be right that we do that here. We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Um, but then um, Pharaoh's heart is hardened again, so ain't nothing happening. Then the fifth plague, uh, chapter 9, death of the Egyptians' livestock, and so sort of the same thing. Um, the Lord, uh, Verse 5, the Lord set a time, saying tomorrow the Lord's going to do this. And it happened, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Sixth plague, the boils. Um, and then Moses, or the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take hands, handfuls of ashes, throw them to heaven, and they'll become, the dust will become boils breaking out. Verse 11, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were upon the magicians and on all the Egyptians. So God is more powerful than on these demons. Seventh plague, thunder and hail. Uh, let's look at verse 14, the end of verse 14. All this, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. God is God. All these other supposed Egyptian gods are not gods. We've also read that all these different things, like um, the gnats, the flies, serpents, locusts, all this, um, reflect different Egyptian gods, but God is conquering, the real God is conquering these fake gods. Verse 16, But for this purpose have I let you live to show you my power, so that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. All right. So it's like an evangelistic thing as well, all these great uh, um, signs. Okay. Um, so the hail comes, but it did not affect um, the land where the Hebrews were staying. Verse 27, then uh, Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned this time. Ooh, we're getting somewhere, Pharaoh. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Entreat the Lord um, to remove this thunder and hail. Uh, Moses said to him, as soon as I've gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord, and this stuff will cease. Um, verse 31, the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was in the bud. So I've got a little note that suggests it's either January or February. So we're getting close to, say, March, uh, where the Passover is going to take place. But Pharaoh's heart is still hardened. Eighth plague, the locusts. Um, so the same sort of thing takes place. I'll go down to verse 8. Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are to go? And Moses was like, Well, everybody, uh, so that we may hold the feast of the Lord. And uh, Pharaoh said, No, only the men are allowed to go, but they ain't going to take that. It's got to be the, the women and the children as well. Uh, so the, uh, Pharaoh's heart is hardened again. Ninth plague, darkness. So if you've read uh, anything about the three days of darkness in modern Catholic prophecy, um, this is biblical precedent, or sometimes there are references to this. And so uh, darkness is going to be over the whole land, because it wasn't a Ra, their sun god, or something. Mm -hmm. So this one's probably conquering Ra, the sun god. 
So there's going to be three days of darkness. Uh, but the sons of Israel had light. Verse 24, Pharaoh said to Moses, Go serve the Lord, your children also may go with you. Only your flocks and your herds have to remain. But they're like, no. Uh, verse 26, tw- um, latter part of verse 26. We've we got to take those with us because we do not know with what we, um, what, what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. We don't know how to serve God. God will have to reveal how God wants to be served. Or as Paul says, as I have received from the Lord, so I hand on to you. Uh, And he explains how to say Mass. So, I mean, again, throughout salvation history, the idea of we determine how divine worship is to look. No. You won't find a single uh, example of that. This is our modern American 21st century consumeristic mentality, and whatever, we're not going down that rabbit hole, but these are just points I just want to bring up, because I'm really tired of hearing people like, well, I want Mass to look this way or that way. Why? Because I like it that way. I'm like, that goes against all of salvation history. That mentality has to stop. So, uh, that's that. Uh, Moses, the very last uh, verse of chapter 10 Moses says uh, to Pharaoh, uh, I won't see your face again. And I think that ends up, that may be true. We'll see if he says something back at him. But anyway. All right, so chapter 11, there's a warning of a final plague. And um, God says to Moses, there's one more plague. And Pharaoh will be forced to drive you away completely. Um, And then he reminds them, uh, as you're going, be sure to tell your Egyptian neighbors or the Egyptians, you know, give us your stuff, and they will be, they will oblige you. They will give you um, their gold and jewelry, etc. Uh, verse three, and God gave uh, the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So God is disposing the Egyptians to give the Israelites their stuff. Um, so again, God's providence is truly everywhere. And you can kind of feel that in culture. Like there's just, there's certain cultural winds that you can just kind of feel like this is, pro- this is at the level of providence, <laughs> you know, uh, what things are allowed in our culture versus what things are not. Anyway, um, verse four, Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go forth in the midst of Egypt and uh, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt uh, will be killed. Man, beast, from Pharaoh's son down to the poorest person. So, everybody's warned. And then, uh, chapter 12, very important, the Passover. So, where does the Passover come from? This is where we learn about the Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be... For you, the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb um, according to his father's house. So if you're too small of a family, join up with another family. Every family needs to procure a lamb. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, uh, a male, a year old. So, you know, God doesn't want the blind three-legged lambs that you're going to throw out anyways. He wants good <laughs> lambs, sacrifices that are worth something, not the, the, the pennies that you're not even going to miss. And so without blemish, this is why um, John in the uh, crucifixion scene is going to draw a lot of details from, from, from the Passover and from the Levitical priesthood, etc. And our Lord won't have any of his bones broken as to be considered unblemished. The Lord will be, he's going to fulfill all of this as the Lamb of God. So it's got to be unblemished. You take it from the sheep or the goats. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day. So you get it on the 10th day, uh, you keep it till the 14th day, that's when you kill it. So you get to know this cute little guy for four days, okay? Um, and then uh, you'll kill the lamb in the evening. 
Uh, then they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel, of, so the front door, the houses, uh, in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted uh, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. So that's why Holy Mass has unleavened bread, because God wants unleavened bread, um, because leaven, uh, they're, they're not going to have time to have the dough rise. Um, now, the Eastern churches, they have leavened bread. It's okay. It's fine. But that's another issue. But this is why we use unleavened bread for hosts. Um, okay, so you're basically to eat, eat that little guy. If you have a vegan in your family, tough luck. Um, either they're going to eat meat that night or have the firstborn dead by the morning. Verse 11, in this manner you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn. Uh, Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hence, Passover. I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So, I mean, there's a lot there that obviously we bring over into um, into Christianity. The blood of the Lamb. July is the uh, month, the precious blood. We're invoking the litany of the precious blood after Mass right now um, because... It's a sign Christ's blood on us um, will prevent us from having eternal death. And not, so the sacrifice of the lamb and the eating of the lamb. If you sacrifice the lamb only and don't eat him, your firstborn son will still die. You have to, you have to kill the lamb and you have to eat the lamb. This is why Jesus in John chapter 6 says, Um, that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have life in us. John mentions in verse 4 of that chapter that the Passover was at hand. John just happens to mention that the Passover was at hand, and then the Lord goes into his bread of life discourse, and that is what ties it all together. That's what makes sense. The Lord is the Lamb of God, so he has to be sacrificed. At the same time, the other lambs are being sacrificed, by the way. And in order for that sacrifice to... Um, apply to you, you have to eat part of the sacrifice. That's why we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, because he's fulfilling all of this stuff. Um, Verse 14, God says this will be an ordinance forever. This would be a perpetual requirement. Well, um, we would argue that at the Last Supper and the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of our Lord, it fulfills. All this is pointing towards what we as Christians do. And the sacrifice will continue until the consummation of the age, until the end of the world. Uh, Then uh, verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. You have to take leaven out of your houses, all of it, because leaven is a sign of sin. um, And you're to eat unleavened bread for seven days. So it is what it is. Um, Verse 21 So Moses called the elders of Israel and is giving them the instructions. I don't know if the word hyssop was up there before, but it's verse 22. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood. Uh, And then you you apply the the blood to your door with it with hyssop. Well, John mentions that they took a hyssop branch, uh, stabbed a sponge with it when our Lord said, I thirst. And that's how they gave the Lord... um, uh, the, 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 the wine, the basically vinegar. And so basically you stay inside until morning. All right. Uh, so those are a lot of important details for us Christians to, to come to know. So uh, verse 29 then, the uh, 10th plague is here. So at midnight, God start, starts striking down all the firstborn in, in Egypt. Let's fast forward to verse 33. And the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For They said, we're all dead men. 
Um, and so the people of Israel said, hey, give us your stuff as we're leaving. And uh, the Egyptians said, fine, take it all. And uh, the end of verse 36, thus they despoiled the Egyptians. And the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men uh, on foot, besides women and children. And a mixed multitude also went up with them. That's important uh, for us to remember as well. So you had the Hebrews, but you also had other people who, for whatever reason, decided to go with the Hebrews. Um, and so they will come into play later uh, during the Levitical period as to what are they obliged to do. If you're going to have non-Jews with you, what are the rules? And then you're going to see that come into play in Acts the Apostles chapter 15 uh, when the church is trying to deal with having both Jews and Greeks becoming Christians. Well, what do you do with the Greeks? They're going to go back to uh, the book of Leviticus to see, well, what did they do with the non-Jews back then? And so you, you first hear about these non-Jews here. Okay. Uh, let's just keep going. Verse 43, the ordinance of the Passover. Uh, it says no foreigner should eat the Passover unless he's circumcised. Um, and you'll see in the early church, no one's to receive the most blessed sacrament unless they've been baptized, um, which is a sign of the covenant. Um, at any rate, uh, let's just keep going to chapter 13. All right, so the Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb, whether it's man or beast. So, to, what does that mean, to consecrate to me all the firstborn? I have a little note, uh, to save them and to make them priests. So it's that firstborn being the priest uh, of the family of man and beast. Well, beasts don't offer sacrifice. No, but they are offered in sacrifice. So the firstborn uh, boys will be like the priests, and they will be offering the firstborn of the uh, cattle or the beast. Okay. Um, and then Moses, uh, in this next section, talks about uh, the unleavened bread. Seven days you're to eat unleavened bread. Uh, go down to verse 9. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. So you'll see uh, very serious Jews today. They will have like this thing tied onto their head and this thing tied onto their hand. And I think it's a verse from Deuteronomy, uh, but this is the first time you're seeing um, the Jews with this idea on your head and on your hand. Um, but uh, So the next section, consecration of the firstborn males. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, uh, you shall set apart to the Lord... Uh, all the fir all that first opens the womb. Uh, verse thirteen: Every firstling of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, buy back with a lamb to consecrate with a lamb. Um, don't break its neck, though. Uh, verse fifteen, latter part of verse fifteen. Therefore. I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. And it shall be a mark on your hand and the frontlets between your eyes, etc. All right, uh, next little section is where we first hear about this pillar of cloud and fire that travels before the people of Israel. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not uh, lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, uh, although that was near, God said, lest the people repent uh, when they see war and return to Egypt. Uh, but God led the people round by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt and equipped for battle. Uh, so, a couple things real quick. So, um, it honestly should have only taken several weeks to get from Egypt to Canaan. Yeah, it ends up being 40 years. And so the fastest route is along the coast, the land of the Philistines. 
but God doesn't want them, you know, if they come, if they see any type of war, to just turn back, you know, uh, on the highway, to just turn around on the highway and come back. And so um, he leads them towards the Red Sea. Now the question is, where is this Red Sea crossing uh, going to take place? Uh, some people think it's much closer uh, to Egypt up here. You know, the modernists will say, well, it wasn't really like part of the Red Sea. It's just kind of like really shallow water and blah, blah, blah. Like they completely downplayed the miraculous, of course. But um, another hypothesis is that the part in the Red Sea is actually all the way down here. Um, but we don't need to get in the way. They're just different theories as to where these things actually took place. And so, at any rate, um, if that's the case, then clearly that, that's a different direction than this highway up here. But if they're going all the way down here, um, so, at any rate. Um, uh, wouldn't it have to be in a real wide spot, though? Because there's 600,000 men. It's yeah. gotta be that's a good point, yeah. That's a lot a of people. Or more people, and that's got to take miles, I would yeah. think. Yeah. So to have it in your mind, like a marshy area, and with the wind, it kind of, it, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's miraculous. Um, the point is that it is miraculous. Um, okay. So then, verse nineteen: Moses took the bones of Joseph. Why? Because Joseph made them swear that when they leave Egypt, they take his bones. Um, that uh, documentary patterns of of evidence, it's pretty wild. Um, they may have found the tomb of Joseph. Um, so I, you know, I'm not going to say for real. But when I, I watched it a couple of times, like I'm not an archaeologist, but it seems legit. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, what else? Verse 21: The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud led them whatever direction, and by night a pillar of fire. Okay, so this pillar, this miraculous pillar is, has popped up. All right, first, or chapter 14, the crossing of the Red Sea. So basically, uh, Pharaoh changes his mind, like, no, we're going after them. And so uh, God tells uh, Moses, all right, you're to be here, being camped here near the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh's army is approaching, of course, and so now they're sandwiched between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. Um, verse, the end of verse 10, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Um, they're freaking out, as I suppose that would be our go-to, right? Um, so, you know, you could have just left us to be servants of the Egyptians. Now we're going to die. But uh, verse 13, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, uh, that he will work for, uh, for you today. Uh, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be still. So when it feels like chaos is happening in the church, and the armies of the devil are coming up behind us, uh, what's our job? When in doubt, freak out, right? <laughs> no, our job is uh, to know that God will fight for us, and we are to be still. They can't change the faith. They can't change the church, despite how much they're trying. Um, the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Uh, tell him to go forth. Lift up your rod. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide it. Okay. And so, verse 19, The angel of God who went before them um, uh, 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 moved and went behind them. All right, so the pillar... That was before them is going to move to behind them so as to be in between them and Pharaoh's army so that they couldn't see them. And so verse 20, uh, there was a cloud and darkness and the night passed, okay, without either side coming close to the other. So Moses, verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. There's a strong east wind. All right, so there is a natural component to this, although it's still nestled in the supernatural. It made the sea dry land. The waters were divided. And the waters, so this is miraculous, but the waters were like a wall on one side and on the other. So, uh, you know, when Charlton Heston divided the, the waters, uh, it very much looked like a wall. Um, 
okay, so they go through, the Egyptians pursue, and then verse 24, and then the morning watch, the Lord, and the pillar of the fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptians, and uh, um, how do you pronounce it? Discomfited? Discomfited? I looked that up. Uh, made them in the confusion? Is that the definition? He brought about confusion on them? It doesn't matter. Uh, let's keep uh, so uh, so he clogged their wheels and uh, so they're stuck in this mud and um, the Lord the verse uh, 26 the Lord said to Moses stretch out your hand over the sea let the waters come back down on the Egyptians and that's what happened and so all of them died and then uh, verse 30 thus the Lord saved Israel uh, that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians uh, dead on the seashore. And Israel saw the great works the Lord had done against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. So this is a highlight for the people of Israel. They're doing a good job. And then uh, Miriam uh, leads uh, the women in song. Well, Moses and the sons of Israel, they sang the song, but then at a certain point, Miriam also leads the women into song. And so uh, Pope Benedict, before he was Pope, uses this as well. Like, this is a perfect image of divine worship. Like, God has done something incredible for you. He has just redeemed you. And so now you sing to him. You're beginning to serve him. Verse 18, chapter 15, verse 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever as a king. So this is a theory. God is supposed to be their king, but they're going to want a human king because all the other kids have human kings, the other peoples, and eventually God will give them a king, but then uh, a human king, that is. But then in our Lord, it's God, Jesus, who ends up becoming king. So God does end up becoming king. Uh, for all the people, just as he had, um, just as he wanted all along. All right, all right. So let's go to verse twenty-two. Let's see if we can kind of move it a clip here. So, uh, how long did the people of Israel just do a good job here? Well, not very long. All right, Moses led Israel onward uh, from the Red Sea. They went to the wilderness of Shur and went three days wilderness, found no water. All right, so they're already being tested. They ain't got no water. So at Merah, uh, they could not drink the water. Um, people murmured against Moses. Sort of like the Jews murmuring against Jesus in John 6, asking how can he give us his flesh uh, to eat. So harking back to the, the wilderness, the, um, the desert. And so... Uh, uh, Moses cried to the Lord, the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. All right, so the point is, almost immediately, people are acting up, just like you and I, okay? You know, we're saved, uh, go to confession or whatever, and then five minutes later, you, you stub your toe, and you just thank the Lord for the opportunity to, <laughs> to suffer a little bit with and for him. Um, okay. And then, uh, so the Lord, there the Lord made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he tested. So now a period of testing. Um, well, I guess we'll continue. They've already been tested. But uh, if, you, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give heed to his commandments and his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I put on the Egyptians. Okay, well, good deal. All right, chapter 16. Now we start to get manna from heaven. So they are in the wilderness of sin. And then um, they murmured against Moses once again. We are hungry. At least in Egypt, we had these flesh pots. And I can only imagine what's in those flesh pots. Um, and so we're going to be out here. We're going to die of hunger. Look at what you've done. And so Moses, then uh, God said to Moses, verse 4, Behold, I will rain heaven from, uh, bread from heaven. And uh, you, you shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them. So again, more testing. So, um, but on the sixth day, you're to gather twice as much, because on the seventh day, you are to rest. Verse 7, and in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord. 
Uh, verse 8, Moses said, When the Lord gives you uh, in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread uh, to the full, um, so, so he's, starting to, he's talking to the people of Israel. So you're going to get flesh in the evening and bread in the morning. Uh, the very last line there, and your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Fast forward, verse 10, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And God said to Moses, verse 12, I've heard the murmurings. And so at twilight, you'll eat flesh. Verse 13, what is that flesh? In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay round about the camp. And the dew, um, when the dew had gone up, there was on the, the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as hoarfrost on the ground. Kind of makes me think of uh, communion wafers. And then, so they're like, what is it? And so the word manna means, uh, what is it? Because it's, it, looked, it looked miraculous. Sort of like the Eucharist is, I don't know, miraculous. Um... So, down to verse 20. But people did not listen to Moses. And they let, so they would uh, leave part of that manna in their jars till the morning. And so uh, it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry at them. Um, and then you hear about uh, Moses telling the people gather twice as much on the sixth day for you to eat on the the seventh day, the day of rest. Tomorrow is, this is verse 23, tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, the holy Sabbath of the Lord. Okay. So uh, verse 27, on the seventh day, there was no manna to be found. It would not rain manna on the seventh day. Verse 31, they named it manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. If you ever go to some church, and receive communion, and it tastes like honey, that's a problem, okay? That means they're additives and may very well not even be valid Eucharist. Yes? Well, is there any significance to the fact that the Sabbath seems to be predating the giving of the law? Or is it just thrown yeah. in there? I was thinking that, too, because the law hasn't been given yet. Right. But maybe the law is reflecting something that, yeah, pre predates it. You know, like murder, you know. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the Sabbath, that's the one that's really not reflective of natural law, is it? Uh, maybe the idea that you uh, serve God in some capacity can be reflected in natural law, maybe. But um, yeah, I don't know. But there are a lot of things that anticipate things later in the story that we saw, like the Egyptian beating up the Hebrew and Moses mm -hmm. killing him, etc., Okay, then Moses uh, tells them, take a jar and put manna in it, and this is to remain. So one jar of manna is to remain, uh, to be a sign, um, place it before the covenant to be kept, so that it can be seen later on, like this is what God has done for you. All right, let's uh, keep going. Uh, chapter 17, water from the rock. Uh, so uh, they don't have any water uh, to drink. Verse 2, the people found fault with Moses. And uh, why does God put us to the test? They murmured against Moses. Um, and then God tells Moses, verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you are to strike the rock, and the water shall come forth from the rock, my people may drink. All right. Um, all right, so this was a place of testing. And then uh, verse 8, you have the first fighting that takes place against Amalek. Uh, so I have a little note. These are nomadic people, whatever. So uh, these people, they come across, and so they duke it out. And so Moses goes up the mountain uh, with uh, Joshua and Aaron. And as long as Moses had his hands held up in prayer, Israel prevailed in the battle. Whenever he lowered his hands, uh, Amalek prevailed. And so Aaron, oh, I'm sorry, it, not Joshua, Aaron and Hur. Uh, held up his hands, uh, one on one side, one on the other side. And eventually, um, well, that's the sign of a cross, ain't it? Um, and victory. So they win, and Moses builds an altar. All right, then uh, chapter 18 will be real quick. So uh, they're now in Midian. So that sort of suggests then that the crossing of the Red Sea happened uh, 
you know, all the way down here, even though the traditional site of Mount Sinai is actually, this is where it gets a little confusing, whatever. So they're back in Midian, which is over here, and Moses is going to come to his father-in-law and tell his father-in-law what all has happened. And, um, but Moses is adjudicating like every case for these whatever million people or whatever. And so, verse 13, Moses sat in to judge the people from morning till evening. And his father-in-law is like, dude, what are you doing? You need help. And so, choose for yourselves. So, verse 21, more, choose able men from the people and make them to be rulers of thousands and of hundreds and of fifties and of tens. And let these guys judge the people at all times. Uh, then you just take care of the big cases. Uh, 24. So Moses gave heed to the voice of his father-in-law and did it. Moses chose these men. Okay. And I guess that's it. I thought there was um, another detail there, but I'm not seeing it. Okay. And that's where we're going to leave off because things are going to get really interesting at Mount Sinai. Any last second questions? We're running a little long today. Sorry. A lot going on. Yeah, hold on, Kevin. Good. Moses strikes the rock. I don't hear my Bible, so I didn't do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that, they say one of the reasons why he wasn't even going to the promised land? The, yeah, that's going to be later, actually. Um, and there's two strikings of the rocks. Okay. Yeah, and I'm glad to be going through this with you guys myself, because sometimes I get confused. Like, what are you <laughs> so yeah, we, we will get there. Okay. Um, I was just going to I had a note in, from a previous study that um, the part where um, you mentioned it was a symbol of the cross when his arms were raised, they prevailed, and when they dropped, the, his arms were being supported, that it's, it was like a call to us to support mm-hmm. each other in prayer, to, to be together in prayer, to mm-hmm. support each other. And to pray for the priests in the hierarchy, mm-hmm. that they keep their hands raised in prayer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but to support each other, absolutely. As to why God would do that, yeah. the best I can, best answer I can give you in terms of why God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, is that He already knew what Pharaoh would choose, and um, again that image of the sun approaching mud, uh, and as the sun approaches mud, like the sun's not, I, the sun is just being the sun, but the the, the mud is predisposed to harden, whereas the wax is predisposed to soften. Um, it's tough. The idea of providence is very difficult. St. Augustine just about throws up his hands uh, at a certain point. It, it's really difficult. Um, but one thing we absolutely hold to is that is that a free will. And so I think one of the temptations we fall into, is it God's, is it God's providence or is it our free will? That's a false dichotomy. Uh, we're this is God we're talking about. It's not an either or. It's not either God is doing something or we are doing something. It is a both and. So God knows everything we're going to do. And he, in his providence, is directing everything. And he's allowing sin. So, but we get, to, but he doesn't do that as violence to our nature, which includes a free will. Uh, so he's both in control, but we also have freedom. It's that's it's a tough one, but yeah, that's as that's as good as I can do in a context <laughs> such as this. So. Was Leviticus that whole section in Leviticus where they're talking about you know, all these special rules and they had to consume in its entirety certain sacrifices and stuff? Is that foreshadowing the fact that? On the altar, you consume, you know, you consume all the um, bread and wine. I mean, is that part of the church's history in that? Um, I don't think this has really anything to do with the Levitical priesthood, but uh, priesthood in general. The idea that a priest offers sacrifice, and the sacrifice is concluded when uh, the priest consumes at least part of the sacrifice. So that that idea of consuming as sort of you know, 
finishing the, the sacrifice and letting it apply to our soul. But of course. Without getting into Augustinian philosophy, it seems that if, if Pharaoh's had just let the people go, and then when the people went, they would have said, well, Pharaoh let us go. Mm. Pharaoh's a good guy. And they mm. wouldn't have this idea that, it, that they owe God rather than owing Pharaoh. And I think if, you know, the Passover wouldn't have meant any, that we wouldn't have had a Passover to begin with. But assuming there had been a Passover and, you know, that you finally decided not to pursue them to the Red Sea, then they would say, well, we owe our freedom to Pharaoh and Moses, mm -hmm. not to God. Yeah. You know, it's not philosophical, but it's kind of human nature. Mm -hmm. And God even says that, you know, that people may know my glory. These things are going to well, happen. Part, he says that uh, he won't listen to me, that my wonders may be multiplied yeah. in the land of Egypt. That's kind of what's going to happen in Egypt. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the relationship with the Israelites, they really got to believe that God did all of this or that. Mm -hmm. And it helps us to understand uh, evil in the world, too. Right. Why did God allow Maria Gretti to be you know, murdered. murdered at such a tender age? Well, had she not been murdered, she wouldn't have had the effect on the world that she did. And that does. So, all right. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, descend upon you, remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all.